Hello, everyone. Welcome to the May meeting of the Sustainability Practice Group. Our topic today is Sustainable Business Trends in 2013. And now, Mark, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Rob. It's um, my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, GEO consultants to present um, this afternoon. Um, they take a unique approach, um, both from a business point of view and an engineering point of view. Uh, towards sustainability. I think it's an important message for our members. And uh, presenting today will be uh, Andrew D. Bolek and Rocco Luongo. Um, I look forward to their presentation. And with that, Andrew? Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us. Uh, this is a great honor to uh, meet with the Construction Specifications Institute and have the opportunity to share our thoughts and ideas. Um, you know, we realize that you're all experts out there and uh, we hopefully uh, won't tell you too much of what you already know, but it's more about a presentation about how we see the way forward. Um, I myself, I'm a, a uh, doctor in economics and law, as well as a, um, a chartered accountant. I've been a consultant in sustainability for a number of years now, and Rocco Luongo. Hi, everyone. Just want to reiterate the thanks um, for having us here today. Looking forward to sharing some of our thoughts with you and looking forward to hearing some of your feedback and questions during the Q&A session at the end. Uh, my background is mechanical engineering and renewable energy, and I'm very happy to be here to speak with you. So we, we'd like to actually take you down a roadmap of sustainability. Uh, we're going to start out today by giving you a quick introduction of through the lens of AGO, where we see sustainability is, and try to piece together some of the pieces. Then we're going to talk briefly about past perception, and then moving on to 2013 trends in sustainability. Um, major issue out there is also disclosure and transparency. Before talking um, somewhat briefly about building optimization and how that's affecting data, machine to machine um, requirements and then up to the future of sustainability, and then back up to the end of the road to questions and answers. So let's get started down the roadmap. You know, one of the things that we've, we've uh, thought about is sustainability is such a big issue. There's so many different definitions out there. Everybody's go-to favorite, for the most part, seems to be Wikipedia. Um, whenever you have a question, what is something? So what does Wikipedia say about sustainability? Well, they say it's a business, or a green business, that is an enterprise that has minimal negative impact on the global and local environments, community, the economy, a business that strives to meet the triple bottom line. You know, the EPA defines it as a sustainable business, that, or a sustainability that looks for the future of tomorrow. The AIA talks about sustainability as a concept to meet present needs without compromising the ability of future generation. You know, everybody's got a different definition out there. And because of these various definitions and the various organizations that are there and the stakeholders, it makes it somewhat of a challenge. So we thought we'd break it down and look at the concept first. You know, the concept of sustainability, it centers on a balance of society and economy for the current and future health. It's about managing responsible resources in all three of these areas. But it means something different to our stakeholders. If you're an owner, perhaps you want increased occupancy rates, cheaper capital. If you're a developer, maybe you want higher sales prices, lower design and construction costs, and quicker sales. Tenants are really about increased productivity if you're working in a business, health and well-being, and lower costs. Now we'll talk about lower costs quite a few times throughout the presentation, but everybody wants to have these lower costs transferred over to them because if they're saving energy and saving money, you know, that's why I want to go into your building. It's kind of confusing though when you look at it and there's so many definitions, there's so many organizations out there. You know, it's about sustainable for the most part. We thought that we would start you out with a presentation on AGO's definition. Sustainability for AGO is about, we agree, it's about the future society, but it's also about commercial success, success for industries and businesses. You know, it's about the mandate to transform a business to respect environmental limits while fulfilling social wants, 
needs an unparalleled platform for innovation, strategy, design, and manufacturing platform. So now that we've given you a definition that pretty much encompasses what everybody's saying, but we're tying it to the one thing, it's about commercial success for industries and businesses. So the value chain of property, whether you're a developer, a real estate investment firm, or even a corporate entity, starts well on the left in the blue area. They have a, these people have to also report transparency and compliance down to investors. So there's a, a element of sustainability that, that's already starting to trigger in. You know, when they go on to property sales and lease, you know, what investment strategy we put across? What debt finance and requirements are there for sustainability? So now the property developers are there and they say, you know, we, we've got to get this higher rents and we've got to get better occupancy. So now let's start to look at, well, how do we get there? We have to put a policy and strategy in place. And that's where, for example, uh, architects, CSI Institute, engineers, other designers come in. They now start to design the way things are, are thought and perceived to be based upon the information that we have. And in many cases, we're so far down the line that we don't realize all the things that happen well above. And it's that disconnect that we're trying to solve for. Because then it's passed off to project liaison officers and facility managers. And so each one of us works in a silo. And we thought maybe it'd be interesting if we took you through some of these steps and what's involved in sustainability. So some of the key drivers that shapes our way forward. If you look at the um, graph on the right, it says really corporate social responsibility or, or sustainability is being driven by shareholders and stakeholders alike. The CEO has to keep a number of things in, in mind, whether it's natural resources, uh, whether it's the capital expenditure, new buildings, and that's passed down to the director who's looking at resources, strategy, and implementation. But what really is it about? Well, to improve a brand image, to build trust, to build a reputation, maybe to save money, to increase employee satisfaction, and engagement, and retention. There's some quite a few studies out now that are saying that in order to retain your employees, 96% of uh, 20 to 24 year olds want to work in a green building, where 98% of the 25 to 28 year olds uh, will stay in the company for that reason. It's also about managing regulatory risk and compliance. And a big issue is managing the overall operations of the business. How do we get there? Well, we have to get there through policies and procedures, looking at things like the board of directors' vision, their mission, their strategy, and their objectives. Once we understood how they do that, there's a whole level of whether you're a consultant or an engineer, an architect, designers, should start to be involved at this stage because it doesn't make a lot of sense to get all the way to the end and say, well, ah, well, we had this great idea, but it doesn't work. So we start early with stakeholder engagement, as well as we hope that you do as well. You're working with the various sustainability teams. One of the trends in sustainability over the last 10 years is the de development of these new sustainability teams. There are anywhere between five to seven people um, depending on the organization, but that's pretty much what we're finding to be the, the average. Corporate business processes are being created all around sustainability. You know, there's education, there's um, motivational tools, investors and stakeholders are taking it, as well as executive management is having to be educated and buying into the project. The important part is how do we map who our stakeholders are? Because at the end of the day, there's disclosure standards, there's financial reporting. What all this means, I'll discuss in a little bit more, is there's a certain level of not material, just materiality, but also levels of accountability. So now we're starting to look at performance, operations, supply chains, transportation. You know, some people might think, well, you know, I'm only interested in the building side of sustainability. But recently, um, one of the companies in Boston was discussing with us that, you know, they have a small fleet of vehicles, 24 in fact. And I think about a month ago, one of their drivers quickly darted out of his car 
to deliver a package inside the building and came back out. Less than two minutes later, he had a thousand dollar fine. But could you imagine if that company didn't have a policy that the drivers have to uh, turn off their engine? That would be $24,000 fines they might receive per month, per day. So by creating policies around sustainability, it also starts to, to play its way down straight to your bottom line. We're also moving into a, an area of personalized dashboards where we have real-time information. We can monitor the health of the building, the health of our workers. We can monitor whether we're in the office or away. The next stage within the um, the value chain is where the architects, engineers, and designers come in. You know, the sustainable engineering and design phase starts to take place. All of this is based upon what the policies and the procedures and the governance and all of those other issues leads to this actual development. And finally, within this brief introduction, we're looking at real-time monitoring. We're moving towards an area where we need to move into not just the 21st century, but move into a new technologically adapted society where we can monitor occupancy health and buildings 24-7 real time. So how do we keep up? There's so many stakeholders, governments, investors, labor unions. I mean, that's a lot out there. Well, in order to do that, we thought we'd talk a little bit about past perceptions. The CEO of Unilever looks at sustainability as not only just helping us live for tomorrow's future, but also driving innovations that make a positive difference. So where are these innovations and how do they affect us? And how have things changed from that perception? Did you know that as little as 10 years ago, it didn't take much effort for a company to portray itself as sustainable? In fact, one of the big issues 10 years ago was getting smokers out of a building. Big smoking was seen not only to be bad for the, the health of the people, but it's also bad for the health of the building because it clogged up things like HVAC systems, etc. But today, that's no longer the case. Design and construction costs are another area. Rocco, can you talk us through this one just a bit? Absolutely. Thank you, Andrew. <clears throat> Now, everybody in this room, or in everyone in their respective rooms, are very familiar with the soft and hard costs of projects, architecture fees, inspection fees, etc. And so what we do, and what, what's important for every project, is to understand how these different fees interact and in the services that each one of them are providing to, to affect the sustainability of the project as early as possible. Site acquisition and building of the structure are going to be very different depending if you have a plan for a net zero building or not. The materials that you choose to acquire are going to be very different if you have a low embodied energy policy in your building material and envelope. Um, so without going through every one of them, again, I know that we're all familiar with them, it's, it's how we can affect these changes through a sustainable policy and strategy early in the process. And then we'll get a little bit further here in a moment, we'll talk about the perception gap, and what it actually costs versus what people perceive it costs to go down the road of a sustainable building. So this perception gap, this comes from uh, uh, the U.S., or excuse me, the, the Global Green Building Council, and it talks about this is a major issue that we see out in the field, and I'm sure most of you have seen it as well. If we take a look at the bubble on the right side, that's the perceived cost premium for a green building, anywhere from about 1% to 29% cost premium. But when you take a look at the actual projects um, brought in, you see that actually it's something like a little less than a baseline building to about 12.5% more for a green building. And we can talk a little bit about how that's possible, but generally what happens is the earlier you get in deciding that you want to build sustain a sustainable system, the cost premiums come down because much of the additional cost is actually coming from bolt-on solutions after the fact and fixes after the fact. It, like we say, is if we can help you line up that pot early, we'll get the best returns. One of the ways of combating this perception versus reality is to actually go through the numbers. Another perception, this is a quote from a doctoral thesis um, from a student where <clears throat> he went out and he interviewed some, I believe, 200 different principles in investment buildings, etc., within the real estate value chain. 
one of the quotes was, here you can read it, but basically they're saying that we're not in it for the long haul, right? We're looking for a three to five year turnaround. And what we found using a net present value analysis, when taking into account the higher value of the building, the higher rents that you can get, the higher occupancy, when you combine all of that, you can see that even within a short time frame, three to five years, that you have significantly more value in a green building than you would otherwise. When you extrapolate that out 20 years, it's over one and a half times. And when you extrapolate it out 40 years, this is two and a quarter times more valuable. Now understanding this is insensitive to policy changes that are coming out later, but if you're going to start, you need to really understand that NPV effect. Oops, sorry. So one of the things that we're seeing is that you know, lowering costs of green buildings. Everyone, as Rocker was saying, you know, they have this perception it just costs too much. Um, in fact, what we found that some of the reasons that costs are coming down is because People are hiring more experienced designers and construction teams. They're also implementing and adopting these strategies earlier, which means waiting until the very end to, to engage your architects or your engineers or whatever is an old mechanism that's proven not to work. These people need to come in at the very beginning of the strategy to say, these are the type of implementations based upon your needs. It's not, let me just throw a wind turbine at it, let me so, throw some, some solar PV at it. Let's actually look at what your objectives are. You know, as you can see from this uh, slide here, costs are not only coming down, but, you know, green construction costs. I mean, there's a mainstay of what's happening here. It's like you have USGBC and the United States, you have green. There's numerous agencies out there that are helping to develop where we are today. Um, there's not a lot in it for if you're just a certified building. The real um, changes actually start to play once you're in platinum. And well, I think one of the messages Rocco uh, says quite often is, you know, whether you're lead or green or whatever, it's not a silver bullet. Rocco? Yes, that's exactly right, Andrew. Just let me make a small correction there. Um, what Andrew said about having LEED certified, that's true. They're really You don't really see the higher occupancy and you don't really see the higher returns on just having a certification. But really starting at silver is where you're starting to see those increased um, premiums for, um, for the returns on the building, meaning the higher occupancy, the higher rents, etc. You know, another area that we're seeing is, you know, not just on new buildings, but retrofitted buildings as well. You know, again, getting rid of that misconception. As we can see here, it's, it's actually since probably the bubble burst in around 2007-8 that the number of buildings that are going LEED certified has drastically increased. And companies are looking both at quick wins, which are anywhere between 0.3 of a percent to 12 and a half percent for improved controls. Efficiency boilers, envelope efficiency, external shading, and the higher costs, which go around the energy performance certification, you know, they're a little bit more expensive. Retrofitting LTD systems, uh, heat recovery systems, solar, passive chiller beams. But what we're seeing is, on the next slide, is there's real value in your assets. Buildings with better sustainability enjoy increased marketability. Rocco, what do you think about this? I really like it. I think that this is very powerful and it really does talk about how the market really is in flux. Um, just as you see premiums for green buildings, the perceptions of buildings that are not green are starting to get what are called brown discounts, where a perfectly good building 10 years ago is being perceived as not having the benefits of green in it. And so therefore you're not seeing these returns. Yeah, I think another area is also if we look at it overall, you know, everyone starting to really get, get it. What is being green? You know, both investors and occupants are becoming more knowledgeable and concerned about environmental and social impacts of the building, and they want these value-added transferred to them. So studies around the world are showing that patterns of going green have really affected sales price and made marketing green buildings even more valuable. Um, one of the things that to also take into account, so we're talking all about these green buildings, there's also another value out there too. There's a trend that we're starting to see and what we call brown discounts. 
buildings that aren't brown or that aren't green are starting to now discount what they used to, to rent their buildings out for to try to, to compete against these green buildings. And so if you're in the market for uh, you know a cheap rent or something like that, maybe that's the place to look for. But we're seeing that there's a number of companies out there that are doing whatever it takes to retain some of their larger clients. Oops. Here we go. Sorry. And you know, a lot of that affects workplace productivity. Rocco, this is one of your favorite topics, isn't it? It is. Um, one of the things that we're seeing more and more um, when we're addressing needs with clients specifically around sustainability is in the area of attracting and retaining top talent and how that talent then performs once they're on board. What we're seeing is that if you have outside views, your, if your employees do, they're getting better memory function, they're getting better call processing, hospital stays are shorter. Simply having access to adequate daylight improves students' test scores, makes people more productive, increases sales. And having um, good quality systems, lighting, HVAC, plumbing, etc., these also increase um, basically the productivity of your workforce. This is part of the triple bottom line. We talk about the economic, the social, and the environmental. Here we're combining that interior, that inside environment, and improving the response of your workers. So really what you're saying is if we're increasing productivity by 18% and we're looking at you know getting people out of the hospitals quicker and people having better uh, cognitive functions, we're really saying that this is something that we could measure and put straight into those financial reports and say, here's not only a reason to do it, but here's money that we save. That's exactly right, Andrew, and that's the point that we really want to take a whole business perspective when we do it. And again, it's important to understand how the sustainability policy drives through your balance sheet into your profit and loss. We have to make sure that we have a truly sustainable solution, not just from an energy perspective, but from a business perspective that this policy will work today, tomorrow, and it's built to change and adapt as the ecosystem changes. So I'm wondering how, how workplace productivity and the other things affects uh, the 2013 trends. Let's take a look. I think what we see here is that you know Walmart's considered one of the leading uh, companies for you know green buildings. You know the president CEO is saying that renewable energy provides 20 percent, 22 percent of Walmart's electricity globally. Wow, that's actually quite a lot. That is quite a lot, and they have some very ambitious goals of pushing that very, very high. I think I've seen them wanting to go to 100%. I'm not sure exactly their timeline on it, but they have a strong desire to be fully renewable. Yeah, and I, I was at uh, Google recently as well where, uh, you know, talking about how they're changing their whole data servers over and various things like that. Uh, but it's all driven from their shareholders and their investors as well. They're becoming, you know, more concerned. And you know, when, when companies like the or organizations like the International Federation of Accountants start to say materiality um, is not, you know, materiality is very, very critical. You know, omissions and misstatements could influence economic decisions on the basis of corporate financial statements. But it also means that directors are being held more and more accountable. You know, we've seen directors being held accountable for some of the banking crises for Enron. Uh, for a number of different reasons, and now sustainability itself is starting to go that direction. That's a good point, Andrew, and, and it's important to remember, on the, oh, would you flip back please one, Andrew? Thank you. On the materiality side, right, you know, Andrew, you have the, the legal background, I'm more of on the technical side, but to me materiality is always synonymous with sort of auditing in that way, and so that then begs the question, as the ecosystem starts developing further and further, and I mean the business ecosystem, as other companies are leading and really paving the way along the road for sustainability, that starts establishing a precedent whereby other directors and companies that perhaps are not could be found to be breaching their fiduciary responsibility if they're emerging something or misstating their, their different sustainability impacts. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. In, in fact, to give you just a different example, in, um most corporate businesses, including banks, and uh, I think it affects most businesses in the United States, 
uh, there's a, a law called Sarbanes-Oxley. Sarbanes-Oxley is pretty much around uh, policies and procedures and making sure that you know you have uh, checks and balances and the, the policies and procedures are constantly being monitored, updated, and people are following them. Um, you know, it, it's very conceivable that uh, they will start to incorporate things like sustainability, but we're also going to be starting to look at you know what building products and are going together, what building codes were used, because let's face it, not every product that's out there actually works well with the other one. It's like I don't think you would mix uh, ammonia with chlorine uh, bleach, because you know, there are just certain products that don't work. You know, another trend that, that we would see is that recently, and I do say very recently, the governments are starting to get involved. You know, we can say a lot for the Obama administration has been pushing green energy and green technology, but what have local governments and municipalities been doing? Well, up until recently, not very much. What I think we can see here is that, you know, Austin, Texas in June 2011, Austin on May 8th, 2013, I think that was last week or the week before, Philadelphia enacts their new laws on June 1st. New York City, they had the laws in place from 2009 that all this changes was going to take place. Not many people took, took notice, but January 1st came up and wow, look at the reporting issues that they have to start to go through. You know, one of the things with the government interventions and some of the cities, especially in New York, they gave people an ample opportunity, go green now in 2009, 10, 11, 12, and we'll cut you some slack thereafter. But if you wait until January 1st, 2013, not only is the price is going to go up, but you're going to be audited every year. And you know, that's starting to mean that there's a lot more interest from the government. Washington, D.C., which you know I'm surprised that it's 2014, but they're going to come in somewhere around January, it's expected. Another area that we're looking at is measuring natural capital. So what exactly is natural capital, guys? You know, it's whether or not you have enough clean water, whether or not you know you have breathable air, uh, carbon emissions. Uh, you know, you see all these smokestacks. Are they being clean? You know, with climate change, and you know, a lot of people babble on about climate change, but you know, I think we can look at the uh, weather that we've had recently, whether it's hurricanes, Hurricane Sandy, Katrina the tornadoes um, in um, Oklahoma this week, you know, there's a lot of other reasons that CEOs, 49% in fact, are listing natural capital as a material issue. You know, very clearly, uh, the CEO of American Journal states that, you know, climate change is a very big topic and they are taking it seriously. And all of this leads into, you know, both your direct and your indirect supply chain. Rocco, you want to take this one? I do. Um, across, the, across the industry, what we're seeing is the supply chain affecting about 60% of businesses uh, as a proportion of their, of their expense as far as sustainability is concerned. And this, of course, varies depending on the industry. <laughs> For example, looking at this slide, the food and beverage and financial services tend to leverage their supply chain much stronger than utilities and oil and gas do, which tend to be more vertically integrated. But you can see, regardless, that there's a significant supply chain impact, which means that for your business to be sustainable, regardless of what it is, you have to be very mindful of what your supply chain is doing, because you are sitting at one point in that value chain. Yeah, I think that's a, an interesting oh. point you make there, Rocco, is that, you know, we can all say, well, we hear about supply chain, but, you know, we're not so interested and it doesn't involve us. But you're absolutely right. We are all part of that supply chain, and it's how we affect it. So when we're advising clients to go green or to not go green or to do this or that, and in fact, we're affecting how that supply chain uh, reacts to the market. And again, taking a look at another source of data, this was published by Accenture, we're seeing again consistency. 50 to 70 percent of expenses in greenhouse gas emissions are coming from the supply chain. And so how to deal with that? You need to start with a comprehensive strategy. You need to evolve that, right? We need a cross-functional approach. And, and I, I won't read every bullet to you, you folks can certainly read it very clearly, but the idea is understanding that supply chain is a major driver in your business and how to manage it 
how to drive it again through your profit and loss. Thanks, Andrew. You, you know, one of the, the, the last trends of 2013 we want to talk about, um, I won't spend a lot of time on it, but I think we, we all see it happening. We might not just realize it's there. It's the virtual economy, the machine to machine. There's so many apps out there that are giving you instant gratification. You know, I can pick up my iPad, as the picture here shows, and I can look at what my building's doing. How much energy am I using? Uh, can I turn my lights on? Can I turn my lights off? Can I turn my AC or heater on? Um, the way of the the way forward is also there's information that's it's information overload to some site, but there's another when I'm looking at a building or I want to rent office space or I want to think about purchasing a building. I instantly pick up my iPad and I say, hey, what information is on this building? How green is it? There's also a plethora of sustainability software out there. Um, the Department of Energy uh, produces quite a lot. A number of other organizations produce it. But the problem with a lot of the sustainability software out there, it only captures just that silo that you're working in. It rarely uh, reaches out across, um, plugs the building in, all the way from CEO down to the facility manager to let you know exactly where we are. But it's on its way. One of the things that we're looking at, and this will be part of where we see the future sustainability going, is buildings, if we're gonna spend the money and the time and the energy and all this hot air that we keep talking about in getting this moving forward, we also need to move forward with the technology that goes with us. So there's new ways of doing virtual ownership. Um, in fact, if any of you happen to be in Boston, you stop by the USGBC um, building, um, I've forgotten the street name, but they share an open space with about 16 other companies. That means if there's a desk there, it's kind of like hot desking. So no longer, I'm not saying it's entirely, but no longer are we looking at the same world of business where somebody rents a, uh, four walls and say, okay, that's my shingle, I'm going to hang it up there. Other aspects and different um, perceptions have to be taken into place. Well, there's going to be 16 different companies and they all want to have some light and they all want to have some heating and they want to have adequate air. So how do we make sure that's all um, put in for them? Um, there's also so uh, software and data centers. Uh, software is pretty simple. We all see that, you know, if you go to buy software now, it's pretty rare you see a CD wrong. In fact, you download it you download it from a cloud. Data centers are moving that way, and so are server rooms. Server rooms have been one of the biggest uh, energy consumption areas of a lot of businesses. Um, you know, they have massive spaces set aside for heating and cooling, predominantly cooling, of course. Uh, they draw a lot of electricity, but if these things are now moving to the cloud, how do we change, not how do we change, but how do we adapt our models for that? So now we're going to talk a little bit about my area, my topic, which is disclosures and transparency. The International Federation of Accountants, Chief Executive Ian Ball, recently said traditional financial reporting alone is no longer enough information for investors and stakeholders. They need a more complete picture. And they want to work with the International Integration, uh, International Integration Regulatory Council to help guide this and achieve this. You know, when big big um, accounting agencies start to get involved, that means things are definitely going to start to tighten up and heat up. So the current state of, of reporting uh, generally stems predominantly from the GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative. It's been around for the past oh, 10 or so years, maybe a bit longer, but they're the guru on the triple bottom line, the economic reporting, the social and environmental. They've recently teamed with the uh, IIRC, the International Integrated Reporting Council, to create a consultation draft of a new type of report. In fact, this report's out there from April 16th to July 15th, if anybody wants to look at it. And I suggest you do, because it's going to talk about a lot of things from how building codes, green codes, um, all the way across the whole plethora of sustainability is going to start to take shape. The Global Reporting Initiative creates the guidelines. They don't create the report, but they do create guidelines for company-specific types of reporting by industry, uh, product-specific reporting, 
all the way down through, and including you know how do we go about national sustainability software reporting. It's this is the key, the key for ninety percent of the businesses out there. The next direct direction that we're moving to, and this is what this whole consultation paper is about, is integrating this directly into a company's financial reports, which means that they're going to have to start to have better understanding, not just what well, you know, the engineers or the architects said I, said I saved 30%, but how do I now measure it and prove it? How do I talk about my opportunities and risks? How do I talk about things like uh, global warming and the fact that, you know, there's been droughts or there's been this. So we have to start to incorporate all of these things into um, our financial and our sustainability report as one that goes to an investor. Remember earlier I spoke about omissions. Omissions are just as important um, down the road because we can effectively be held accountable uh, and some directors could go to jail because you didn't report that, hey, we looked at it, but we, we didn't want to do it. Now we're going to have to start to tell people why we chose the decisions that we did. It's all around risk mitigation. I don't know if most of you knew this, but the United States alone has suffered from severe drought since 2007. So, you know, we're looking at everything from extreme weather, how that affects water. Um, I read a report recently that said water is expected to be one of the scarcest um, resources on the planet if the current state stays the way it's going of droughts. By 2050, only one-third of the planet will have water. I hope it's in America. So now we're going to talk a little bit about building optimization, and I'm going to change the presenter over to Rocco for this one. Okay. Oh, um, sorry, Andrew. You're going to have to keep it on yours because um, it's only yeah, going to be up on my screen. Yeah, okay, hold on a moment. All right, did that push it back to you? Not yet. All right, hold on a moment. Let me get it back to you here. Up top of the right it says change presenter. Yep, I've got it. Here it goes. Okay. Oops, Holding optimization. So. So what we wanted to do here, folks, and we're trying to be mindful of the time as well. We've got about 20 minutes left. We want to finish up here in the next five to 10 minutes and leave plenty of time for Q&A. But we wanted, to, we wanted to do something very tactical as well. Andrew and I have spoken up to this point about the, you know, the, the external influences, the ecosystem, the government compliance reporting, et cetera. We want to take and make, a, like I said, a very tactical example of for example, if a client or a customer of yours wanted to build a net zero building or a highly efficient building, what steps would they take to do that? And so what we're going to do is how to go through those seven steps now. Thank you, Andrew. Um, building orientation clearly is going to matter, and it's going to vary depending on the shape of the building, the position you are on Earth, etc. And we're going to see that this is going to tie in through the other steps. This orientation is crucial, especially if you've got sort of solar systems or wind systems, et cetera, that are going to be integrated into the building. But beyond that, when we get to the next slide, Andrew, when we talk about the building massing, we're going to talk about, again, the local climate, why that's important, what's the purpose of the building. And we're talking about the volume and shape of the building and the rooms themselves, because these are going to drive the heat loads in, then the HVAC loads and the plumbing, et cetera. And so all of these things are very interconnected. One of the things that we're seeing in, in new green buildings is, would you please flip back to number two before we jump? Thanks, Andrew. One of the things we're seeing is a lot of these new green buildings are using things like green roofs and green walls, and using things like, like extensive windows, extensive fenestration, and large um, sort of atriums. And these rooms can, ex can, depending on their orientation and their size and shape, are going to take in tremendous heating loads and require tremendous cooling loads from their HVAC systems to maintain comfort. And that's also variable depending on the building position and orientation. So the effect that we're moving to virtual officing and things like that is actually going to have, could play a bigger role. Absolutely. As spaces get more shared, more modular, right, these kinds of influences are going to really take hold to a larger degree than we've seen in the past. Would you please flip to the next one? Thank you. 
Daylight optimization, again, is almost a subsection of the previous one, but really it's worthwhile to look at it in its own way. And this ties into the BIM system. Uh, again, going, if we think back to the slide we showed about increased productivity of workers, better test scores of students, shorter hospital stays, we can clearly see that the optimization of daylight coming into a building is critical. Um, also, the way we use artificial lighting to augment the natural light, this daylight harvesting, is very a very critical thing, and it's, and it's very well represented in the technology with LUX sensors and, and variable um, uh, ballasts, e-ballasts, etc. And so, without, again, digging too deep down into it, this is another stage along the way. How we use our water is also critical. Andrew touched on it a moment ago. I believe very strongly as well that the next 50 years will be very much a water economy. Who has it, who doesn't? As cities become more and more crowded and the third world starts rising up um, with their own economic strength, they're going to be needing more and more water. So what does that mean? We want to try to get to a point where we're using each drop of water more times than once when it comes into the building, before it actually goes out of the black water system. So harvesting rainwater is part of it, but also having a gray water system that collects water from things like showers, sinks, and clothes washers to be reused either directly in flushing toilets or then through some sort of an on-site treatment system is very worthwhile. Uh, energy modeling, I'm sure, is something that we all heard of and that we're all familiar with. Again, this is tying in the weather, the location of the building, the orientation of the building, the actual design as far as the windows and the, and the walls are concerned, and understanding based on that location and those um, variables, how much energy is really passing through the envelope of the building, and how much HVAC, what sort of controls are best for maintaining um, proper environment inside that building. I think also we're seeing that uh, technology is playing a key role in this as well, especially advanced technology. Absolutely, Andrew. Um, and we'll get to that point in just a moment. We talk about telemetry and more of the the machine-to-machine um, -machine communication. Okay, I was thinking also around the BIM. Oh, of course, yes. Um, as far as the BIM is concerned, um, that's the um, <coughs> excuse me, the building information modeling. This is where you have like it's like a CAD system specifically for this kind of work. Please go back, yeah. Um, and then we start talking about, remember, needing to let the lead, excuse me, let the need lead. So before you decide what kind of wind generator or panel you might want to put in, you need to understand your goal, right? Um, renewables are sort of like farming. You can't grow coconuts everywhere in the world you want, and you can't generate the same kind of solar or wind anywhere you are. So we need to make sure we understand the building um, in, its, in its totality and then the need of the business. And again, materials, how the buildings are built, minimizing that embodied energy, and using highly efficient materials, you know, is, is critical as well. And again, I'm yeah. getting sensitive to time here. Tying them all to building cuts. Exactly. Um, and so this is an area where we, we expect that you folks at CSI are very, are very active, is understanding these green codes, um, especially um, what's been put out by the IGCC. They really are the first model code, but what we found and what the architects and the general contractors are saying is that there really is no cookie cutter solution, right? The adoption of these codes are going to be lumpy across the shades of green in jurisdictions. And again, one of the biggest challenges, and this is what we see over and over, is in the education or re-education of stakeholders like building officials who choose to adopt the code. So very briefly, we're just going to talk about data and M2M. You know, there's so many measures out there, so many things that we have to um, start to measure. So dashboards was where you're at, Baraka. Yes, thank you. Um, let's again, let's kind of do this relatively quickly so we have time to get to the Q&A. Let's just flip ahead to the dashboard. This is just one example of a dashboard that's, that's, that's developed by NREL. And this really talks about, again, the whole building. Then you can look down at the subsystems, mechanical, cooling, heating, data center, et cetera. These, of course, can be customizable. They're all web-based. So you have this opportunity at a distance. Can you flip the next one, Andrew? So you can really see what, um, did you flip back up one? Yeah, so you can really see how the machines are talking to each other, that it is all integrated and web-based, and how the building sees itself. So again, in the next slide, then, 
we talk a little bit about telemetry and about these integrated management energy controllers where you're measuring electricity, gas, and water, right? These are not, these are not new. Everybody's been, we've been measuring this for a long time. But when you combine that output with occupancy, alarms and security, et cetera, and you bring that all through with 24-7 um, reporting, it, it starts really allowing this tremendous amount of data to be intelligently managed and understood in real time. Thank you, Andrew. So just briefly about where we kind of see the future of sustainability. You know, here, here we've got uh, Mr. Shibula, the director of InfoSystems. He's saying, hey, it's not a reaction to a risk, it's our core value. What he's really saying is here, it's not only here to stay, but now we're going to incorporate it, and it's going to play a very important role. So the future of green buildings for me as a lawyer, I'm, I say it's going to be around integrated reporting. Rocco, he thinks it's probably going to be around, you yeah. know, Go on, Robert. Are you, yeah, yeah, sorry, Andrew. Right, real-time optimization. When you have all these systems talking to each other, you have data scientists out there who can write the algorithms to make sure that these things are working seamlessly. Occupational, occupant help is critical. Uh, sustainability throughout the value chain we talked about. Uh, yeah. Net zero as a minimum requirement, I believe, is going to be coming an end of life cycle considerations for the materials you're using. I mean, we see this in Rojas compliant already, but I believe this is going to be taking a role even further in the forefront. And of course, yeah. are there others? Absolutely, there's no limit. But, but you know, just going back to what I said, of course, you know, being a lawyer, I, I'm always stick by my guns on this one. It's going to be that integrated reporting. It's going to be those investors, those shareholders, those other stakeholders that want and really just need more information and so that's going to lead us into all the other areas to make sure that you know, people are being delivered what they say. So thank you for listening to our presentation. We're now to the Q&A. Um, Rob, you want me to pass it over to you? No, you can leave it there, Andrew. This is Mark. Um, a couple questions and again people are, are welcome to type in questions into the chat box. Um, you showed some um, slides about workplace productivity um, gains, and uh, perhaps after the uh, session, you don't need to go to that now. Um, there were no, there weren't um, sources listed there, and I think if um, maybe we could uh, follow up with um, some sources of the workplace productivity gains because those were pretty staggering. Um, um, As a matter of fact, Mark, I'm just gonna I'm gonna dig that up right now, and I'll post it right this moment. We have it right at the tip of our fingers. Okay. Well, again, it can be um, you can send it to um, uh, Rob, and it can be uh, connected. Um, you know, as an architect and specifier, we see um, certain companies positioning themselves as as green companies. And whereas I might work on a certain number of buildings uh, a year, uh, you know, um, a major manufacturer might already have a hundred buildings um, that they manage. So I think that that message uh, is getting across to architects and and specifiers um, when you work with building product manufacturers um, um, is, is that a group that you see trying to influence this marketplace as well I would expect yeah absolutely it's uh, definitely not especially it goes all the way across to their supply chain so the um, um, well, I, I agree with you. I, I think that uh, companies like uh, Interface or Kingspan and um, uh, Seek have made a, a pretty good case, I think, to designers about their own sustainability goals. And often that's a lot less confusing than someone coming up with a red list and, and uh, not having the education or the balancing to, to be able to choose between a product or another. So. Um, can I put it just a little different way on, on that one for the supply side? Sure. It, it's a bit like this. We, we all agree that green buildings, not necessarily always, but you know, putting su uh, sustainability into our business itself, there's dramatic savings we can make. If we could get our suppliers to do the same thing rather than pass their wasted costs on to us, now that's 60% on average that every business is out there seeing we start to see cheaper and cheaper prices come in and cross. Well, but then you have the, um, you know, you, you want to increase the, the asset value, um, 
do you ever see an increase in the fees for design to, to pay for that research, to pay for that analysis? Um, architects are, are often um, saddled with the same fee. Now they're doing BIM modeling and now they're doing well, different types of reporting, but um, how does the design professional impact that asset value? Uh, the design professional impacts that asset value simply because when you're starting to make the designs, you're looking at the, the data that's out there. You know, um, I, I would suggest that we, we look outside of our normal business areas. It's like if you start to look at the reports by KPMG, Deloitte, Price Waterhouse, you know, they invest a lot of time and money on doing this basic types of information to say, hey, here's where some real savings come from. Now, companies like uh, AGO, and I don't want to use this like a sales pitch, but companies like ourselves, we go in and we work with their policies and their procedures to see not only what the company's looking for, you know, what their end goals are, but then we start to look across at their suppliers. And, you know, maybe the first things we look at, for example, is, What's the reputation? If I go to a company that has a poor reputation or not a green reputation, will that affect mine? So these start to become knock-on effects that those companies want to do business. And so it's, it really is a knock-on effect. I don't think that these um, changes are going to affect the design fees that much. Okay. Um, um, Rob, are you showing any questions that, um, that I'm not seeing? Uh, no, I, I don't believe so. Ryan Trimble. Okay, you got me, sir. The, um, well, one of the slides also talked about how existing buildings um, that uh, went through a green transformation um, seem to have a better um, return than, than new construction. Um, why do you suppose that's so? Rocker? There. So yes, um, it, basically what we're trying to say there, Mark, was not so much that they, they have a better return for two reasons. One is through higher occupancy, higher rents, etc. But the other reason is that if you start with a new building, if you start with um, you know your your strategy from the very beginning, you're seeing these kinds of returns with fewer costs because they're integrated. All right. So in other words, on this. Um slide, um, the rent increase at 6.1% for new construction um, uh, compared to other new construction, I would guess that's maybe non-green. So if you go with existing buildings, uh, green or not green, that's where you see your greatest rise in your potential rent. That's where I see it, but I also think that when you're looking at this slide, the way I interpret that is if you have an existing building, you're going to see a larger rise because there's been this big shift in the building, whereas with the new construction, it's been more incremental. That's the way I interpret that one. What do you I mean, the here? new constructions are generally, um, let, let's say before they're built, probably about 60% of it's already sold out anyways. Right. Well, that's just uh, the way financing seems to work um, yeah. these days. Um, All right, so uh, if there are um, no other questions, um, I'm, I'm glad that um, your slides were so robust. This is, I think it's going to, I'm going to need to go back and, and look at these uh, one by one. I know that uh, Rob will post your uh, email addresses and uh, attendees are, are welcome to um, uh, connect with you in, in the future, I'm sure. Um, so, um, Andrew and Rocco, um, with that, I'd like you to thank you very much for sharing your expertise. Um, that's quite a lot of food for thought. Well, thank you for inviting us. It's uh, really a, our privilege to speak before your organization, and we hope to, uh, we've added some value, and we'd like to uh, come back again. All right, thank you. And, um, Rob, I guess, um, that, that's it for today. For those of you uh, attending, thank you for taking the time. Remember that you can share this uh, with others in your group or friends or forums. By uh, In a couple of days, this will be up on the uh, CSI website. You could also uh, probably Google this on, uh, through YouTube and find this presentation as well. And uh, will that, with that, we will conclude. Thank you.